The microphone's on now. <laughs> Okay, we're getting a little late start today. Everybody wants to talk to Pat. We've been watching him come out of the sanctuary. They want to have a few extra minutes with her. We're so happy today to have Michelle Erpenbach back. She was here last year and talked about Thrive, which uh, addresses the needs of preschool or of school age children from cradle to career. And it was so interesting, and they're doing wonderful things and it was very enlightening. So today we're very happy to have her back again and she's gonna talk about our Eat Well food market and we, we know that we've all been concerned about um, the food deserts in this town so we're gonna hear more about that. Michelle? Great, thank you. I have a microphone so oh, you can right. keep that one. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here. I always um, appreciate coming to First Presbyterian and you are always welcoming and open and I appreciate the work that you are doing across the community and so I'm glad to be here to share some more information, particularly about food security and some of the ways that our community is working together to solve some of those or to help solve some of those issues in terms of, of children and, and their needs. So as we noted, um, Thrive really is where the, where the community's cradle to career workforce development initiative. That means that we were created actually in 2017 by, by um, leading organizations of the community, Chamber of Commerce, uh, United Way, those kind of folks got together and said, we need to figure out how do we build our future workforce. And the, the concept was that idea that we have the future workforce right here in our own town, but we need to make sure that each of those children has the same opportunities for a good start in life as everyone else does. And so that's the cradle to career piece of it. We don't work directly in the schools and we actually don't provide direct programming, but we do work in that, what we call the ecosystem around the schools. We look at three important topics. The first is, is that child sleeping in their own bed tonight? That's affordable housing. We got to make sure that our kids and we have a housing action team that their motto is no children sleeping in cars in Sioux Falls. And we know that tonight there will be at least one child sleeping in a car in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. The second one is uh, out of school time. It is that 
the opportunities that children have, you know, they only spend about 20% of their time in a classroom anyway. What are they doing when they're not in school? Is someone, are they supervised in some way? Is someone helping them with their math homework? You know, is, are they being read to? All of those sorts of things. So that out of school time, and, and we've talked about that prior in terms of the childcare um, issues, particularly for that birth to about five, six age, where all our brains are being developed. And so we look at out of school time. One of the, the biggest pieces that we're, we've been working in now, and it seems to encompass everything we do, is that concept of food security. What's there to eat in the home when the child does get home from school? Is it just peanut butter and crackers? Or is it peanut butter and crackers? At least there's something there. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about food security, is, is are, are, are all of our children, all of our families, accessing food, accessible to food in um, ways that they need it to be. We base everything that Thrive does is based on data. Many of you have seen this chart before. This chart holds pretty, pretty solid for us in Sioux Falls. About between 30 and 35 percent of our children in, the, in school in Sioux Falls are either what's called low income or super low income, which is below the poverty line. They are in those families that are struggling every day. And that, again, that's about a third of our kids are still in that situation and continue to be. So I was asked today to talk about food security, and it is one of the sort of crushing things that is happening in our community now. And if uh, my husband and I were talking this morning about, you know, we're, we're in an income bracket where it's, we're comfortable, but man, it hurts to go get groceries. And I just think, what if I weren't in the situation that I happen to be in, thanks be to God, what if I weren't? And so the, the, the repercussions on food insecurity in our community are just dramatic. And we did, um, Thrive did a, uh, we worked uh, with uh, Augustan Research Institute. 2018, we did a survey on food security, and then we updated it in, in 2022, just as the pandemic was kind of slowing down. Our numbers for um, children who are experiencing food insecurity in um, Minnehaha County, 17% in 2022, and we know that hasn't improved. That is, it was a four point increase at that time from 2018 to 2022, and it's three points higher than the national average. Feeding, or Feeding America says about 14, almost 15% of children in, across the United States are food insecure. Minnehaha County, it's more like 17, 18% of children who are food insecure. So we talk about the ideas of um, food deserts and uh, residents living in poverty. When we talk about a food desert, it means not just that there's not maybe a grocery store within easy access, but it also means that the income isn't um, again, that level that it needs to be in order to, to make food affordable. And it has to do with, with the availability and the affordability of food. And so those definitions of food deserts come straight out of the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Big issues with food security are the concepts of um, those folks who are food insecure tend to be less healthy. They tend to have more diabetes. They tend to be, more, t tend to be overweight. Um, and that leads to other problems. And then the biggest thing that happens in Sioux Falls for so many of the conversations we have around social justice is, has to do with transportation. There are neighborhoods in this community where 15 and 20% of folks don't have access to their own, their own vehicle. And so I always use the story that they're using their cousin's vehicle and he lives about a half mile away. This week it's got a flat tire or the battery's dead and nobody can afford to fix it. Gas is still in the four to five dollar an hour range or a gallon range. We have to be concerned about transportation when we talk about food security. So the thing that's happening, and I realize this is a little bit uh, lighter color than, than uh, what the rest of the slides are, but I'll give you just a, a, an overview of what the food security um, system building process is in Sioux Falls right now. At about the time, and we'll talk about the mobile market in a minute, but about the time that that process started, the city of Sioux Falls was saying, you know, Thrive is running this lane of food security. Let's figure out how we get more food into neighborhoods, those sorts of things. And the city of Sioux Falls was trying to do the same thing. And they said, can we just put this together and have Thrive facilitate that process? 
And so for the last year and a half, Thrive has been facilitating a new concept of a food security strategy in the community so that we have wonderful resources. You know that. You're, you're giving to Feeding South Dakota just down the hall right now. Feeding South Dakota is amazing. Faith Temple is amazing. The Salvation Army has a wonderful little food pantry over in the Whittier neighborhood. Your church very often, churches across the community have um, food giveaways. Those sorts of things are happening all over town. But what's happening is it's not, a, it's not systemic. There are pieces and parts and bits and, and, and it's hard as an individual who may be in that poverty situation. It's difficult to figure out where those resources are. And we know that it's more and more difficult for us to get affordable food into the community. And so a couple of things are happening with this strategy. One, we, um, Thrive has had since 2017, 2018, a food security action team that really is working and focusing on the strategies around this. They came together then and said, you know, we really need to talk about policy. We need to look at what are the, what are the rules that we have as, an, as a community and as a state what are the rules that we've put in place that have become barriers to food security? So we have a policy team. We also have um, a food security network that is really working on that concept of making sure that we see where all the pieces and parts are. And eventually, there will be some kind of something there, but we're in that, that sort of transition learning phase. But um, they're tapping into community connectors and some partner teams. That Those community connectors are those people that are either in lived experience right now, there's, uh, there is a woman that lives at the Union Gospel Mission who is on that community connector team. There are folks who uh, work directly with, um, with our native population in the schools, they're on that connector team, so that we have easier access to those folks with lived experiences. We think about, and I can say this in this room, you know, I'm just, I'm just a little old white lady in Sioux Falls. I don't represent the diverse community that's here in Sioux Falls. I can stand here and preach to you and I can go into a neighborhood and preach to them. It's not going to make the difference that it does if it is someone with the same culture, if it is someone with a diverse background, if it's someone who has lived that experience of not having food in their, in their homes. And so that's what those community connectors are about. It's, it's for us an easy stepping stone so that we can, we can be that, that power and that support behind the process, but those community connectors then have that, that capability to get us where we need to be in order to really be helpful. And then the fourth piece of that uh, system that we're building is the mobile market, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But I wanted you to see some of the goals that they're talking about, and I'll read them just real quick, just the, the two, the vision statement for food security and building this system. Food security vision is to create equitable and sustainable access to nutritious food in each neighborhood in a dignified and culturally appropriate manner. Now, there are a lot of Caucasian folks on that who have come from a, a nicer background than others, but there are lots of folks coming into that group saying, I can help with the culturally appropriate part. I can help you understand what it means to provide food in a dignified way. And so we're building that system around those concepts. And then we're also looking at that, that concept of healthy eating. That wasn't um, part of our food security action at the beginning, but we're talking more and more about that concept of is it okay if my kid gets um, uh, Cheetos and a Red Bull for breakfast on the way to school? Or are there other ways that we might provide some sort of healthy, would a Pop-Tart and half a banana be better? Those sorts of conversations are happening around that concept of healthy foods. So these are the food deserts currently in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It does encompass about 60,000 people. It's about 11,000 children. Um, it's, no, I'm gonna, getting my data wrong now. 11,000 people of the 60,000, 11,000 of them are in that low income or super low income range. And many of them, again, are without vehicles. And I had a conversation with a city council member when we first released this report. He says, this looks like, this shows me living in a food desert. What does that mean? I, I'm, I'm not in a food desert. Well, no, because you have a fully functioning car and the high V is, you know, two miles away. You can drive over there and you're not technically who we're talking about. But your neighbor down the street in the, because if you think about driving around Sioux Falls, our zoning lets us have mixed use neighborhoods all across the community. So your neighbor down the street might be truly experiencing a food desert, 
even within blocks of your, your um, more privileged background. So the, those maps are key to that concept of who are we talking about, what neighborhoods are we talking about serving. So at the time, and you all remember this, it was in the middle of the pandemic, right as it was coming to a, more of a slowing down, um, Hy-Vee closed its location at Kiwanis and 10th Street, and the whole community kind of went up in arms because they literally announced it and did it 30 days later. And the, the response from the city was, let's just hold and see what happens. But very quickly after that, they said, you know, we have this ARPA dollars, we have these federal dollars coming into the community. Can we use that in a way to, to think differently about food security in particular, but to think differently about how we allow or provide access to food, to, to retail groceries. And so they put a grant out, several different folks um, went after it. There were several organizations that said, hey, we could do something with that. And none of them got it. And so the money still sat there, it was $400,000 and it sat there and a couple of those folks came to, to Thrive and said, would, if we came together and did this together, would Thrive help us? And that's how Thrive got into the business of grocery stores. And it was, it was that idea and we brought John in and, and folks from all over the place, their First United Methodist Church is involved, several folks like are here. And that was what they started with, was this line of ensuring equitable access to regular, reliable, healthy, affordable food, retail food, because the grant required that it be sold. We can't give it away, so it has to be retail, and this is where they started. Their objectives then were to, again, figure out how do we, how do we really make this easier for folks to get to the food? How do we strengthen that local food system? Can we think about bringing, you know, we've got producers not far away. Can we get food to these neighborhoods faster and easier? And then promoting healthy, eat, healthy eating behaviors in Sioux Falls. The project overview, it, I realize it's small. I'm just going to review it quickly. The mobile grocery option serves a couple of purposes. One, it does, it, it addresses that uh, transportation problem that I talked about. It puts the grocery store into the place where people are who are in need. The other thing that it's doing, and we're starting to see it now, is that it's starting to scout locations that might be truly in need and could then do a pop-up like a mom and pop type small grocery store on a different model than a high V. And there are a couple of neighborhoods that are starting to show that already. Um, so then a couple of other things that, that in terms of project overview, it is all about those relationships that we can build with people in the neighborhoods. Again, those community connectors, who are the leaders in those neighborhoods that can help us find the right place for it to be? Can they help us figure out what are the culturally appropriate foods to have on the market? Are there neighborhoods where, they, where we're much more likely to sell tortillas and beans and rice? And in other neighborhoods, we're gonna sell ground buffalo and uh, hamburger buns. Those sorts of things are critical, and we don't know that. We're not going into the neighborhood where I live. We're going into neighborhoods that we want to become more familiar with, and so we're building those relationships. And then it really does come down to that improved affordability, and we're talking about the grant originally wrote this concept of a different way of doing inventory. And so instead of putting the same things on the market as are maybe available at hy V or at Sunshine, let's put on that market things that are in, in, in the, and I'm learning this about the industry, in the industry, these are called overstock, and some of it's called salvage. And the best example of this type of grocery is that um, Cheerios on the 4th of July, you know, leading up to the 4th of July, they'll have red, white, and blue boxes. On the 5th of July, they're no longer worth anything to that grocery store or to that producer. And they literally go on the 5th of July off the shelves and into the trash. They go to the landfill. There is nothing wrong with it. The only thing that's the problem with it is that the box is red, white, and blue. And this happens on a regular basis in the food industry. And so we're going after the red, white, and blue Cheerios boxes. We're going after the boxes and cans that are maybe a little dented. They are, they're getting a little bit close to, to date. And we understand that part of this, this is what's growing out of it, it part of this is preventing food waste. So we talk about, um, a really great example is the, um, 
think about boxes of graham crackers, when you think about the grains that are required to create graham crackers, the farming that's involved with creating those grains, the amount of diesel fuel that it takes to plant and weed and uh, spray and all the things that you do to grow grains, and then the diesel fuel and the manpower and all the things that it takes to get to the point where it's a box of graham crackers. And it becomes a pallet of graham crackers then, and it's in a warehouse, and Johnny, the new uh, forklift driver, hasn't really figured out how to make it turn and runs that box of graham crackers into the wall and it's suddenly dented. There is nothing wrong with the box of graham crackers, but now Heidi won't sell it and it will go straight to the landfill. And so that's part of what the mobile market is doing, is being one of those stop gaps in that process in the industry. We really do, it's um, one of those key things is community engagement. Um, we really do rely on the concepts of who are the folks that are using this product, who are the people that are interested in shopping in this way, and we're really making um, headway with um, building relationships in those neighborhoods. We have a ton of volunteers that are involved with this. Every time that we um, kind of pull the data and go, okay, we think we're gonna move from this location to that location. One of the things we do is we take those volunteers and we go door to door and you know leave a flyer. This is coming to your neighborhood. Here's when it will be here so that people understand that it's, going, that it's coming there. Um, lots of opportunities then for gathering data we do a lot of focus groups, interviews, those sorts of things. We're in fact right now in the process of doing um, the, after, the after sale survey. So we have Augie students sitting outside the market at every location right now. And those students are saying, and they said it to me because I, I do my shopping when I stop by and they're like, okay, we're here as so we're doing a survey about the mobile market. And I'm like, nah, you don't want to talk to me about it, but talk to the next person that's behind me. But they're doing that, figuring out what is it, again, what's, what are people interested in? What's a dignified way to get groceries in your neighborhood? Those sorts of things. And so that's working out really well. We do a lot of, it's required the grant because it's federal dollars, we required lots of um, evaluation and we'll be working through that for a period of time yet. So the group of people that came together and wrote the grant um, became the advisory board. And they are the folks who really we rely on in terms of What's next? Where are we going? Who do you know that can help us do? And I highlighted First Presbyterian Church because John and Pastor Pat have both been involved heavily in this project. And in fact, um, there are two freezers sitting in the uh, warehouse at, um, for the mobile market that were purchased with dollars that came from you all. So I'm here to say in person, thank you very much. We did write nice little thank you notes and all of that, but it's not quite the same as saying, you know how much meat we're able to buy in a, in a larger capacity? We can buy what much more meat and save it because of the fabulous freezers that you have, that you've provided for us. And the, the story that I've been telling to, and the advisory board knows this too, is that the, two, the first two we bought were lemons. And so thanks to Carl's here in town, um, they're awesome in terms of service. And we said, uh, they're not freezing, what do we do? And they said, we're coming with new ones. And they did, they just replaced them this week. And so that's the kind of collaboration that happens around projects like this. And I'm just grateful that you are the kind of congregation that's really involved in this and you understand your role in the world. So just briefly talking about the mobile market itself, I know some of you have seen it. It is truly a grocery store on wheels. It is a 38 foot trailer. Um, it's pulled by a Dodge Ram Dually, which has six tires. It's the most, it's the biggest pickup truck I've ever seen. And um, it's, as you can see, it's a gooseneck that is over the back of the truck. This is what it looks like inside. It, um, everything is kind of strapped in, so that's the black stripes that you see, because things jiggle when you're dragging groceries around the community, and so um, that's how that looks inside. Everyone that comes in says, it's way bigger than I thought. It's, it's bigger and it's nicer. Um, so it does, uh, the folks on the left here are a young mom that she shops almost every week and has had some health problems and so we're really grateful that we're in her neighborhood. We started out when this picture was taken, it was off in a different neighborhood that wasn't selling like we had hoped that it would. 
And she says, we ran every red light to get here because we wanted to make sure. And now it's in her neighborhood and she, she's having some health issues. And so one day when I was there volunteering, she came in a wheelchair with the two kids and we literally hung bags of groceries on that wheelchair so that, that her son could help her get home. And so those kinds of things are happening all the time. You can see that picture in the middle. It is just one aisle. There's the dry goods and sort, all those sorts of things on one side and then the freezers and coolers on the other side. It is, um, if you imagine, this, is, this trailer is the size of, uh, generally it's uh, customized to, be a, to hold a NASCAR vehicle. So you think about how big a vehicle is. The back comes down, there's a ramp in the back, so it has ADA accessibility. You can roll your wheelchair in there, your walker, whatever. And then it has beautiful glass doors that open up just like at Hy-Vee or any other grocery store. And then you come in and there's a basket to put your, your items in and it's just, it's a normal shopping experience. And then for those folks who are, you know, those lower income folks that do have those benefits, the SNAP and EBT benefits, those are on a card now. Those are the old food stamps. You remember, you maybe saw your neighbor or friend with the little stamps having to count them out. They don't do that anymore. And it adds a piece of dignity to that concept. And so we do accept that. And it's no different than me swiping my, credit, my debit card, my credit card, that a mom with an EBT card comes in and swipes her card just like anyone else. And then this is some of the examples of things that, that we're able to do with the mobile market. There's baby food and baby products on now. We're doing a thing with, uh, it just cracks me up. This is, this is another story that can't be in the data, but it's a really great story. We did, um, we're, the mobile market has started at Hawthorne Elementary School, and you all know where that is, way out west. Tough, tough neighborhood. And we, we were switching dates pretty fast and furious, and so it was almost a pop-up. We had barely let people know it was going to be there on a Monday afternoon. It's raining, and I'm over there taking pictures, and in comes this mom and her daughter, and the things they said to us was, one, we've, wa we've watched, we've seen you on social media, we, know that we knew you were coming, we have tried and tried to be to the other locations, they didn't fit our schedule, now you're right here in our neighborhood. And there were giant, I swear, big frozen pizzas in there that day. And I think they're in there almost every day now for six bucks. And this girl was probably third, maybe fourth grade. She picks up that frozen pizza and she holds it like this because that pizza is going home with her and nobody's taking it away from her. And mom is going to feed the whole family for less than 10 bucks because $6 pizza, bag of salad, we're good to go. So that's what the sort of meal ideas under $10 are in the middle. And then the far right side is a whole bunch of really cool pumpkins we got last fall. So that leads me into the concept of if you're doing gardening and you've got extras, we're absolutely willing to take those. We will do almost like a farmer's market alongside the mobile market as it moves around town through the summer, through the growing season. This was a great donation from a woman who was involved with the, with the project early on and she said, my husband retired and now he plants a half acre and I don't know what to do with all that food. And so she's being super generous with us. Current locations and times now, um, we're up to, we're four days a week now, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. The thing that has changed is that we're hitting those neighborhoods where elementary schools are. The Title I schools that are, as, as you know, above or north of 18th Street, those folks who are, their families, the numbers tend to be more than 50% um, free and reduced lunch. They are the low income, super low income families. We're in there during those times when parents are coming to pick kids up. Plus, we're there long enough that those folks who live in the neighborhood are able to walk in and, and do that kind of thing, and that's working really well. Thursday mornings, we're now at Del Rummel Village, and we sit right next to South Dakota Urban Indian Health. So we're hitting two audiences with one stop there, and it's super popular, only been, only been going a couple of weeks there. Then finally, uh, just talking about the impact so far, a couple of things. We all kind of dread that day when, when uh, we may have to leave our homes. And this young lady um, is 94, and she was still, at the time that we took this picture, still living in her own home. Her kids would shop for her and bring whatever they wanted. She sees the mobile market, and she's about, she lives about two houses down from the stop at that point. And, and she comes in, she knew she needed a cloth bag, and she knew she needed a card, and she comes in and the thing she wanted was sardines, because her kids do her shopping and they won't buy sardines. And by golly, there are sardines on that market all the time now. But it's that concept of, again, she can care for herself. 
in, for a little while longer because there's this accessibility. Your support, and you all know this, you've done amazing things in terms of uh, providing funding for, for parts of this project. You've provided volunteers for us. Um, but the key things that you can do besides volunteering, the big support really is just stop by and shop once in a while. You don't have to do your whole you know, month's groceries there, but the, the products are quality, they're interesting foods, the, the rotation it happens a little bit, but there's always, always those great frozen pizzas, there's always frozen bison, um, hamburger, those sorts of things. Things you would expect in a grocery store are always there. And we are always, we know that um, based on the business plan, and it did, it opened the 1st of October, based on the business plan now, we know and it's not a surprise. A project like this is never going to make money. And we think it's always going to need something of a subsidy. We're testing that model now. But there's going to be a point where we as a community are going to have to step up and just toss a little cash. We think it's between fifty and $60,000 right now for the year to make sure that we break even and pay staff. Um, so that's those are kind of the ways that you can really be involved with that the other thing that i would say to you then is that we're in that process now of thrive started with this project the end of 22 when did we start john because we we submitted the grant in january of 23 right so john and i have gotten to know each other really well we've been working like crazy for a long time the agreement that i made with the thrive board was that we will support this. Again, remember I started by talking about Thrive doesn't do direct programming. We really see ourselves and we have developed that reputation that we are really a, an incubator for ideas. It was way easier, and, and one of the examples is a KidLink project that has now the school district has taken it, and it's the community learning center model. They took it and multiplied times 23. It's in every school in the, in the community, every elementary school. We started it as a pilot project like this in two little elementary schools up north of 18th Street. This project is the same way. Thrive is not going to, I've said over and over again, I'm not going to run a grocery store and a trailer for the rest of my career. And that's not my role. That's not Thrive's role. We're here really to take some of the risk for the community. We did get the, the grant award and we have used it to buy the equipment and, and to supply staff and all of the things that I had no idea what went into a grocery store and all of those just the expenses of just setting up a small business right and so Thrive is in the preparations and, and making a transition will start we have a consultant coming in a volunteer consultant who has done national level change management work which is amazing lives here in Sioux Falls she's going to run for us that change management process that transition to where is it going next the thing that the mobile market needs is a home it either needs to be its own nonprofit organization which is is a, certainly a possibility or it needs to come in and live under an existing nonprofit thrive is not going to own it thrive is not going to sell it thrive is going to give it to the community that's why we did this in the first place it is a community asset will be owned by the community of Sioux Falls and by all of you. It'll just be living under a nonprofit that can do the HR things and make sure people get paid. We think it's about one and a half employees right now. There, and the biggest question I get is, what happens when you find out that you don't have enough trucks and that we, there is more to be done? And the answer to that is that not only is Sioux Falls and smack dab in the middle of some pretty significant food deserts, but the entire state of South Dakota has food deserts that are for an agricultural state it's just almost embarrassing but what's happening is and the feeding south dakota has told me this is they'll take their you know monthly food giveaways into the example she used was wagner and i don't know anything about wagner but she says we'll take a truckload of food in there and give everybody a box and a couple gallons of milk for the month but there's no place to then use those ebt dollars those food stamp dollars, there's no place to do that without getting in a car and driving to Yankton or Mitchell or wherever. That problem is endemic across the state of South Dakota. And so that's maybe the next challenge for the state. But locally, there is that option. There would be that possibility of, so we need, to, we need a mobile market that goes to Lenox or we need a mobile market that goes and parks out at the corner of 
whatever and whatever south of T and, and, and is available to those folks who are in distress in other parts of the, of the state. So all of those are big dreams, but they're things that can absolutely happen. For now, we want to make sure that this is a solid business plan and that it works for this community and then it can be replicated all over the place. That's everything in a nutshell. I know that I'm running. Yeah, we're, we've got time for questions. So yeah, Carol. Okay, so two questions. Yep. Do you have oh, yep. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> two questions. Yes. Uh, one, is everything in the mobile market able to be purchased with EBT? Yes. The difference is what we're working on is the WIC list. Okay. And so the, the EBT, the food stamps, are for anything in terms of food, right? We don't have cigarettes, we don't have pop, all those kinds of things. Anything on the mobile market can be purchased with EBT. We're working on the WIC thing, but the WIC issue is that's a USDA federal program, Women, Infants, and Children, and it is a benefit that then requires that the grocery store that accepts those dollars has a massive list of inventory and some of it, and I'll say this to you because I know that you understand the world, some of it is based on lobbying by food produ production companies. So it requires a certain brand of, Dan of yogurt that happens to belong to a major you oh. know, soda pop company, those kinds of things. So we're working on it. We're trying to get a waiver because we'd love to be able to take WIC. But you don't right now we take don't. WIC. Right. Yeah. It, it is a lot it, to, for those folks watching online, it, it does have a lot to do with the size of the, of the market itself. We just don't have the space for seven kinds of yogurt and 15 kinds of cheese and, you know, yeah. all those kinds of things. And it is that concept of there needs to be a little bit of a change in the rules because we're, while we're the only mobile market in South Dakota, we are not the only one in the country. And, and there are all over, the, all over the United States doing mobile markets like this, there has to be a way for the USDA to give some leeway for smaller projects like this. And so that's, there is a WIC project happening in South Dakota right now, and we're kind of begging. So Carol, sorry, and, go ahead. And the other question I have is if, if we wanted to be able to give gift cards to the EBT, or to the mobile food market. Where do you go to buy those? Right to the market, or how do you do? How do you do that? And can it be in any denomination? Like, or is it twenty-five dollar gift cards or fifty? How how does yeah, that process? Absolutely. Work? And I apologize. I don't have it on my phone yet. I sh I should be able to sell gift cards to you right now, but I don't have that set up on my phone yet. But yes. So for your for your congregation, there's a couple things that you know. One, that there are folks that walk into your church on a regular basis who are looking for food for some sort of they need gas dollars, they need whatever. You could absolutely have a supply of these gift cards at the desk in your church office so that those can be part of the of the gift that you give to those folks in need. The other piece of that is that and, and our young woman that was our example, of the, the woman who I told you ran all the red lights, she was in there one day um, when I was volunteering and um, she came in and she said, I have $20. And she knew she was gonna have to do the math and she and I are both really bad at math. I'm a journalism major and you know, it just didn't add up quite right. She hit more than 20, but it wasn't like she was, buying, again, Red Bull and Cheetos. She was buying healthy items for her kids. And so that's where those gift cards come in. She ran to 25, oh, we've got a $5 gift card, don't worry about it, and nobody's gonna say anything about it, right? So that, that, absolutely. So for now, the best way to do it is to stop by the mobile market and to buy them, but we can also, we'll figure out some other ways to do that. That's one of those pieces of this project that we haven't really smoothed out yet, so. Great question. Appreciate that. We're absolutely ready. I, to do I was just thinking, like, our at Christmas time, we often do um, gift food baskets and stuff to Hy-Vee, But what if we did food instead of food baskets to Hy-Vee, What if we gave our families um, money mm -hmm. gift, gift cards to the 
yeah. Eat well. Right, because the, the other part of that is 25 bucks, a $25 gift card will go way farther in this mobile market than it will at hy or anywhere else. And that's not a ding on hy It's yeah. a, you know, wonderful, yeah. you know, but it is that concept of, I, again, if I'm on, on EBT, I'm on food stamps, I only get X number of dollars for a month. They go a lot farther when prices are dramatically lower. My husband was eating cereal this morning before he went golfing and he looks at the box and it's got the sticker on it from the market and it was $1.50 for a box of Raisin Bran. He said, how much would this be at hy -Vee? You know, four and a half, five bucks. Yeah. And they're smaller boxes, they're skinnier. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's a big deal. So it, uh, we could buy like $150 totally. gift cards to that? Yeah, okay. absolutely, absolutely. All right. All right. Thanks. But, yes. Uh, Here, hand him the, yeah. But. Yeah, so Michelle had also talked about like corporate sponsorship items. So we have had some um, various like local businesses that have sponsored the market for a week or said, hey, we're going to donate a certain amount. And so it became, you know, this week's, everybody's getting a, what, 15, 20% discount on behalf of mm -hmm. X local organization um, type of thing. So there's, there's various ways that um, we're trying to look to find those kind of donors and find ways that they can put in um, with that kind of stuff. So, you know, other organizations, um, businesses around town, um, you know, wh whatever they're interested in, like if, if they want to donate product, if they want to find things. Um, you know, one of the things right now is we're talking about is early in the growing season. So like we've already um, pre-purchased food from some local growers to f upfront their cost for their seed growing that then um, later this summer, we're going to have produce from there that uh, we can sell right away. So yeah. Um, yeah, there's lots of that financial ways um, because we're new and we're trying to figure this all out that we're attempting in any way that we can be creative and um, get get people involved. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and that's part of one of the other things. Uh, the question is, you know, can can you donate other things? Um, We've, in the last month, we've had several d discussions and we're, we're trying to change, um, we've made some changes to the back end ways of what we're sourcing all our food. Um, and so instead of having, um, being in strict uh, at the products, like finding ways so that, all right, we've got a whole bunch of donated green beans, but now they're different brands, right? Uh, being able to set where we can take those in, we'll sell all the green beans for 90 cents in type thing um, as opposed to like well we've got four different brands here we don't want to you know these are normally sold for more so um, we're, we're trying to um, overhaul those processes on the back end so we can take that kind of donation in from um, various different people in that kind of yeah stuff. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and we are part of um, bread break um, Do we have some of this one? This one is not part of bread break, okay. partly because it's tough to see. Yeah, if you want to hand those out, that'd be awesome. Um, it's tough to sell that food. And so what we're doing is um, mostly, what, to John's point, is we'll do, like green beans is our example. That was what came up in the meeting the other day. We're out of green beans, and our order doesn't come from Minneapolis for another week or whatever. First Presbyterian, can you everybody bring a can of green beans on Sunday morning so that we can put them on the market tomorrow? Those kinds of things. And so we'll be doing that. But um, we are doing, we have a partnership with um, Sioux Falls chef, Chef Ellen Dora, if you know her. She's doing prepackaged meals. Because what we're running into is with a retail grocery like that, it's difficult for the Panera leftovers to come to and then be sold. So we have to follow sort of the food cycle that way. Um, but we're ending up, one of the places we're at is now is the Laura B. Anderson Elementary School. And there's a little Mennonite church up there that does a food giveaway on Tuesdays. They're doing the bread break. So that neighborhood gets those pre-made meals from Panera because those great sandwiches and all the things. And then the next day they get the mobile market so they can fill out the groceries. Through, no, 
for when bread break does it, they're a gleaning operation, right? They go in and take those leftovers that are out of date, that are pre-made foods. And so that can't be resold, but it can be given away. We don't have the space to give away that, those numbers of, of food, and Bread Break has a really great system, and so we're kind of, they're kind of partners, but we're not, not doing it to that level. Other but, questions? But yes, yeah. we are open to all sorts of yes. interesting partnerships like that. Yeah. Yes. So like, we have all these kinds of dreams, and they're, um, we're, we're slowly building that kind of stuff, and now that we've been around and operating more, and people are seeing us more, it's a little easier to um, understand, like, this, this is how this would best work with us, or, you know, the nice thing about Thrive is with the other food security action teams, if we have those conversations and say, you know what, this is not the best fit for the, the mobile market, but uh, our partners over here, you need to go, you know, you need to go talk to Earl and Kathy because they run this operation over there, and like, they, we can take your thing through them and get it to mm -hmm. people that didn't. Yeah, exactly. The other thing I would say about donations, you guys have been awesome for us. A couple of other, the, the story I didn't get into is the concept of when we wrote the grant, initially we were going to get um, old city buses to do this and just rip out the guts and put in shelves and all this stuff. And the city was, it never said it to me until later, but th there was 400,000 miles on each of those buses at that point. And um, the, just the wear and tear and all of that and they said oh thank god you didn't do that because it would have been a disaster but we ended up with a great partnership with feeding south dakota and so that vehicle that you saw in the picture is um, was originally donated in rapid city as a food pantry that would go into neighborhoods it was very quickly discovered that it was way too small it's huge for us it's perfect for us way too small as a food giveaway and then the pandemic hit and you know how feeding south dakota is doing neighborhood based now um, and so they said before you get one of those buses, come take a look at this and see. And so we spent a lot of time with the advisory board going, yes, but because it was donated, we need to buy it from them. We had X number of dollars in that original grant, so that was the first down payment, because that was what was gonna buy the, and refurbish the bus. And then now we are in the process of fundraising for the rest of it. We're down to, we have a, we have a wonderful $50,000 grant from the Wellmark Foundation that has helped us make that payment. And now, now we're in the process of finding the last $45,000. So if you know somebody who would like to help buy a truck and a trailer, hook me up. You had a question. I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, one is volunteers. Uh, so it's coming to Dal Rummel, and we have a lot of people around us who could probably use that truck. Um, if I were to volunteer, how do I go about that? Well, stop by the truck. I mean, if you're an online person, it's eatwellsf.org and you can click and volunteer and there's a little form you fill up. If that's not your jam, stop by the market when it's at Del Rumble and just say, I'm ready to volunteer. Literally, they're gonna put an apron on you and put you to work. <laughs> so okay. think about it before you volunteer. But it is, it's, that's what we're looking for though, is that I don't wanna drag volunteers from the east side of Sioux Falls into the, that neighborhood where everybody knows everybody already. So we're doing that same sort of thing at Hayward. There are Hayward moms and dads that are coming in there. And at LBA, it's that whole, the, that neighborhood is kind of where Thrive got its start with, with kid programmings. And so the volunteers up there are coming out of the woodwork. So it's awesome. But yeah, absolutely. Question number two. You know the small level, if you have neighbors that want to shop that aren't going to make it out, if you want to be the person to shop with Right, and what John is saying for those folks that are with us online is that if you could be a personal shopper, if you can, your neighbor is unable to get to the market, stop by and say, you know, what do you need? And give me your card, do you trust me with your card? And off you go and get the things that, that your neighbor needs. Absolutely, those are the kinds of things that are going to help build the, the community around this. The thing we've talked about, again, dream state, is deliveries. How do we, you know, we even at one point, we were talking about the, when we were writing the grant, we were envisioning little Boy Scouts with, with, with wagons. We really were dreaming big, man. But yeah, that'd be super helpful, so, yeah. Okay, my other question is, no matter who comes in the door of the trailer, they can 
by what they want. We're not checking. We're not checking tax forms. No, no, it's open to anyone, and we always say, you know, the first, the first customer was the mayor um, at the grand opening. But yeah, I shop there. Um, I have friends that shop there. Folks from all over are shopping there. That is, again, one way that you can support it because the more you buy, the more we're able to, to supply more. So it will never, it's not, and I can say this to you all, you're not taking food away from someone who's hungry by buying at the grocery, at the mobile market. You're not taking food away from people in need. You're just helping us support the project. Well, Dal Rama provides the service for people. I mean, they will shop for the residents who can't, Sweet. which is great. Now, do they all take advantage of that? Probably not. They also provide a van for people to get in the van and go to the grocery store. But we're surrounded by people who don't have that. That's exactly right. That's one of the big benefits of being in the Del Rommel neighborhood is we know the, the data there. So great, that's awesome, thanks. Because the um, the people that are, the staff people said that they can see Urban Indian from where they're parking. So I, I assume they're on the street there, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, but your staff knows you know, the Del Rommel staff to to give them credit has been awesome. They're super excited about this because of that concept of yes, you can go get on the van and go to the grocery store, but this one you can just walk down and hang out with your friends and get some groceries. Right, that's, there's another whole, a whole conversation, right? How we don't necessarily pay the folks well enough that care for our elders and so, absolutely. There'll be people that'll be shopping there. Great to see all of you. Thank you so much. I'll hang around for a few minutes if you have other questions. I did hand out flyers that kind of talk about why we chose a mobile market and that gives you some of that data. But uh, great to see you again. Thank you all so much.